AM radio, an op-ed column, and Fox News is not enough. I want a center-right nation to fight for its soul, and its soul is represented in the arts. Its soul is represented in, in a world in which media is everything. AM radio is the lowest form of communication. It's tinny. It's not robust. It's not avatar. I want avatar. I want the right to enter the world of media to the extent and invest in media the way that the left does. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them because the people know the truth. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House, but I'm president and they're not. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast, a Breitbart.com podcast. The podcast starts now. Here's Kurt with today's headlines. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Great show lined up today. Got Michelle Malkin and one of my favorite people in the world, Jerome Hudson from Breitbart. Michelle will lend, well, I, I probably was mistaken in saying that she'll lend sanity to the insanity of the left because I don't think that's actually physically possible or emotionally or psychologically. But one of the smarter folks in the world on on uh, this country and its history and what's going on in the world today she is uh, an investigative reporter for one of my and one of my new teammates uh at crtv she's going to join me first and then jerome hudson from breitbart's going to join me jerome is uh if you haven't heard jerome hudson you hang out uh because he's worth listening to but i want to get to the first bit of this show which is the sound bites every day i try to play sound bites in in many ways to kind of be a verbal drudge report just to kind of give you a look into some of the things you're not going to hear on mainstream tv because the left is doing as much as it can to hide idiots like this. But I want you to listen to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And there's two different sound bites. The first one, I want you to listen to her defense, initially, of the Israeli occupation of Palestine. Yeah, so just listen up. Dynamic there in terms of geopolitics of and the course. war in the Middle East is very different than mm. people expressing their First Amendment right to protest. Well, yes, but... I also think that what people are starting to see, at least in, in the occupation uh, of, of Palestine, is um, just an, an increasing crisis of humanitarian condition. And that, to me, is just where I tend to mm -hmm. come from on this issue. You use the term the occupation of Palestine. Mm. What did oh. you mean by that? Oh, um, I think it, what I meant is like the the settlements that are increasing in, in some of these areas and, and places where um, where Palestinians are experiencing uh, difficulty in access to uh, their housing and homes. Do you think you can expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd also just I I am not the expert on geopolitics on this issue. You know, for me. I'm a firm believer in, uh, in finding a, a two-state solution in this issue. And um, I'm happy to sit down with leaders on both of, this ish on both of these. For me, I just look at, at things through a human rights lens. And I may not use the right words. <laughs> I should have added this before, but I think it's more impactful after. The woman you just heard has a degree in foreign relations from BU. She just talked about the Israeli occupation of Palestine, and then when the, thank God, the reporter had enough uh, shoots by the collar on it, she was backpedaling like, oh, well, I think what I meant was, and I'm really all about human rights and the two-state solution. I mean, that woman won an election. Now, let me, let me double down on this one. Listen to her talk about why the unemployment rate is so low. Now, the economy is going pretty strong, right? There's roughly 4% unemployment, 3.9% unemployment. Um, do you think that capitalism has failed to deliver for working class Americans or is no longer the best vehicle for working class Americans? Well, I, th I think the numbers that you just talked about is part of the problem, right? Because we look at these figures and we say, oh, unemployment is low, everything is fine, right? Well, unemployment is low because everyone has two jobs. Unemployment is low because people are working 60, 70, 80 hours a week and can barely feed their kids. 
And so I do think that right now when we have this no holds barred Wild West hyper capitalism, what that means is profit at any cost. Capitalism has not always existed in the world, and it will not always exist. Capitalism hasn't always existed, and it will not always exist. That is the left. That is the face of the left. Unemployment is low because everyone has two jobs. Oh, and by the way, people are working 60, 70, 80, 80 hours a week. I know she's never going to be exposed to it, but the world's a really hard place. Really hard place. And and. People are working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, not because they're trying to feed their kids, but we've got a world full of people trying to keep up with the Joneses because they think they should have everything everyone else has at any cost, even your family. And the fact of the matter is people that work 60, 70, 80 hours a week are people that I want in my country because they understand that capitalism is the driving force behind everything we are and do. Because there are there are no hold no no limits. You can go and be and make as much money as you choose to, as much money as you want to, given the choices you make in life. This is a woman again. She won an election for a political office, a primary, against the the fourth ranking member of the Democratic Party, because she believes that Israel occupied Palestine, and the unemployment rate is low because everyone has two jobs. And I said it the other day. Please, for the love of God. Keep letting her speak and give her every forum she wants. Her and Keith Ellison and all of them. Just let them keep speaking because they will seal the midterms for, for Republicans. One of the things that we have learned over the last couple of weeks, it's gone by the wayside, by the way, that Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court nominee who's going to get confirmed, is clearly a, uh, a constitutionalist. And by that, I mean, for anybody that doesn't know, and most of you already do know, a constitutionalist is a judge or a law enforcement official or a, a justice that abides by the laws written in the Constitution. Okay? They're not there to interpret what it might mean. They're to, here to tell you what it meant. And the NRA, which has taken a beating since Parkland, because apparently the NRA is at fault for everything that happens that people don't want to be accountable for. They, they, they launched, I want you to listen to this ad, and, and it, it's pretty powerful. Let me ask you a simple question. Do you believe you have a right to defend yourself and your family with a firearm in your own home? Four Supreme Court justices say you do, but four say you don't, because the deciding vote announced he's retiring. And your most fundamental right to self-defense could be extinguished. This is our opportunity to protect the one freedom that guarantees all the others. The freedom that makes America different from every other country on earth. The Second Amendment is at stake. America is at stake. We are the last place on earth that still believes in the fundamental God-given right of self-defense. And we don't care if we're the last ones in the arena. We will never ever stop fighting for this freedom. We're the National Rifle Association of America and we're freedom's safest place. If you take nothing else from that commercial, take this. There are four Supreme Court justices who believe defending your life in your home with a firearm is not a right. Think about that for a second. And that is, by the way, a, a God-given right to defend yourself and your family. And why is that important? It's important because of this next soundbite. Keith Ellison, who is just an American-hating, capitalism-despising Thank God the DNC deputy chair, because another guy who every time um, he opens his mouth, a conservative voter is born. But listen to Rabbi Michael Lerner talking to Keith Ellison, and Keith Ellison talking about why our borders are an injustice for those trying to cross them. Listen to this comment. Take, for example, Mexico. Since, since NAFTA, Mexican wages have dropped between 9 and 13%. Now, some people have said to me, oh, Keith, you know, that's too bad for them. And my answer is, no, that's too bad for us because that means those people are going to be a low-wage sector, not only in Mexico, but in here in the United States. And the only and, and an undocumented worker is an exploited worker. That, that We just have to say that the, the 12 million undocumented people in the United States are, are here because somebody wants them to be but what they want them here to do the work, but they don't want them to get any rights. They don't want to pay them fairly. They don't want them to be able to uh, collect bar bargain collectively. They don't want them to be able to get occupational safety and standards 
And that is what's really going on. And these trade agreements, you know, what they, they allow capital to travel over borders. And all capital is, is people who happen to own something we call a corporation, which is a legal arrangement, which gives them special rights. Uh, and labor, which is a regular person, cannot travel back and forth across the border. And so corporations, certain people who get certain rights, can go back and forth across the border seeking out the lowest wages, but people, regular people, cannot go back and forth across the border seeking out the highest wages. So what it creates is an imbalance, it creates an injustice, and, what it, and, and it creates the need for something like a global Marshall Plan. Yes, we need to have fair trade uh, rules. Yes, we need to make sure we raise labor standards everywhere, not reduce them. We need to raise environmental standards everywhere, not reduce them. But we also need to rebuild the part of the world that so many of us uh, rely on to get everything from cheap flowers to cheap strawberries, to cheap this, to cheap that. Um, we need to understand our yeah. interconnectedness globally. If you take nothing else from that soundbite, did you hear his disgust as he talked about corporations and, and owners, uh, big companies? He, he's disgusted with people that are successful. Remember, Obama, you didn't build that, right? You didn't build that. That is just a further message of the left's disdain for people that are successful. And I would argue that peop those, those, those corporations he hates so much are the ones that create all the jobs in this country. And the left's hatred of them is palpable. And finally, uh, I got two more good ones. In the Fox Newsroom, Rand Paul, who I said yesterday, in the 18 months since President Trump has been elected, I have become a much bigger fan of Rand's. Uh, I, I still disagree with a lot of different things he's, he's up for or against, whatever. I'll fill you in with a point yesterday that I said yesterday. I'll fill you in with one again to elaborate on a point he's going to make. Listen to this. You know, John Brennan started out his adulthood by voting for the Communist Party presidential candidate. He's now ending his career by showing himself to be the most biased, bigoted, uh, over-the-top, hyperbolic, sort of unhinged uh, director of the CIA we've ever had. And really, it's an insult to everything about our government to have a former head of the CIA calling the president treasonous just because he doesn't like him. But realize that Brennan, you know, I filibustered Brennan. I, I tried to keep Brennan from ever being the leader of the CIA. But realize that Brennan and Clapper uh, are known for wanting to expand the authority of the intelligence agencies to grab up everyone's information, including Americans. And so I don't have a lot of respect for these people. Even before they decided to go on hating the president, I disliked these people because they wanted to grab up so much power and use it against the American people. Let's be very clear. John Brennan, when he talked about the, the first piece where he said he voted for a communist presidential candidate, John Brennan was a member of the Communist Party, not a friend of, not acquainted with, a member. I would argue this is much like Senator Byrd's leadership of his local KKK chapter. Not involvement, but leader. He led it. We're supposed to buy that horrible comments made on a bus by the president define who he is, but these actions of these people are irrelevant? <laughs> See, and here's the thing. When you look at what's happening, polls everywhere, the left can't even hide them anymore under the guise of, of fake news. There is not going to be a blue wave. That is, that is coming to fruition. And every time Trump opens his mouth to support a candidate, that candidate's chances of winning go up. The polls change dramatically. And uh, I have to laugh at the, the idiots uh, coming out of this Russia conference. When... There is some sort of agreement and peace between the two, uh, and we, we stop you know, hovering over the, the launch button of the two nations that own 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. The left is going to go berserk for some other reason. You know, This was the same thing that happened around the Kim meetings in North Korea, right? Oh, my God, he's going to go to war, and oh, my God, he's bought by them. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's laughable, and they don't it, – it's willful ignorance is what it is, and it's, it's sad. And then I'm going to jump off tangent here. One of the things you've watched in the last 10 days to two weeks is people that like Ocasio-Cortez who don't know about history, whether it be uh, domestic or foreign, continue to incite Hitler and uh, the Holocaust and Kristallnacht and all these other world-changing evil events. And they continue to try and put parallels, which is it, – it's embarrassing for them to hear them say these things. But – they have to because it's the only way that they can look at themselves in the mirror. I want you to listen to Natalie Portman talking about 
consuming meat being the equivalent of the Nazi era atrocities. Listen up. Nowadays, many of us speak up for animals, but it wasn't always like this. Decades ago, one man articulated the plight of animals so boldly that the modern world couldn't ignore him. His name was Isaac Besheva Singer, a writer who was far ahead of his time. Isaac Singer won the Nobel Prize for writing about individuals who dared to challenge cultural norms. The heroes in his novels championed women's issues, gay marriage, and especially animal rights, decades before PETA pushed the cause into the mainstream. Isaac Singer grew up in the same part of Poland as my family. And like them, he fled the horrors of the Holocaust. But the cruelties he witnessed made Singer one of the most powerful writers of the 20th century. When Singer stopped eating animals, he famously declared, I did not become a vegetarian for my health, I did it for the health of the chickens. His sensitivity can be traced to his childhood remorse for pulling the wings off of flies. He wrote, I realized that I was committing terrible crimes against those creatures just because I was bigger and stronger. I prayed for forgiveness and my thinking about the suffering of flies expanded to include all people and all animals. The experience appears in his novel, Shosha, in which the narrator laments, we do to God's creatures what the Nazis did to us. In The Slaughterer, Singer writes about a young man who loves animals, but is appointed his town's ritual slaughterer. Tormented by the cruelty of his actions, the slaughterer ponders the roots of violence. Singer wrote, as long as people will shed the blood of innocent creatures, there can be no peace, no liberty, no harmony. Slaughter and justice cannot dwell together. Anybody that knows me, and all of you guys that have uh, out there that have followed my Periscope know that uh, there are a few people I've ever met that care more for animals than I do. I recognize that there are some outlandish situations going on as, as it relates to animal cruelty, and that can not be denied. But to equate pulling the wings off a fly to the gassing of six million Jews is ignorant at best and just plain stupid at worst. And she mentions a, a group that is probably as dangerous and, and violent and bad for animals as anyone, and that's PETA. I mean, PETA is, is at the epicenter of the left's BS. Remember something, and I keep saying this and I've said it for years. The left is the very thing they scream to hate and, and they claim to hate. But remember, Antifa, the left's group, is a group calling themselves anti-fascists made up 100% of fascists. That's the, the reality of the world we live in. We're going to take a break. Be back with CRTV's Michelle Malkin. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Why did we see some of the Republican kissing of Mark Zuckerberg that was taking place. I called it kissing the ring because I felt like every single person practically had to kiss the ring of this guy, you know, who wants to do nothing except get all those people out of office. So, you know, bizarre, bizarre behavior from the Republicans. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Welcome back. Joining me now is one of the smarter people on the planet when it comes to uh, what's going on, in, in not just in this country, but around the world. She is from CRTV, CR, Michelle Malkin Investigates. Michelle Malkin, good morning. How are you? Good. I was just saying, welcome to the family. That makes us brother and sister now, yeah? It does. It does. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to start off by making you laugh because I'm sure you already have heard it, but i got to say it again. Mark Levin's comment yesterday that liberals have more positions on Russia than Stormy Daniels. Aye. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God! You know, it, it's I, I look at the the people at CRTV, and I I wish we could clone humans, uh, and have all of all of you guys teaching in our schools. Because when I see a professor making a comment here out of California, or a professor there who's who's standing up for for uh, the abolish ICE movement, and I, I it makes no, it, it makes it uh, very easy to understand why we have uh, an Ocasio uh, Cortez uh, who. By the way, has a degree in foreign relations from BU uh, and doesn't understand Israeli-Palestine. Uh, and, and, and she's out there, and I keep saying, I need her to keep speaking, because every time she speaks, a conservative voter is born. Yeah, 
<laughs> it is so true. She also has a degree in uh, economics from Boston University, <laughs> which now costs seventy thousand dollars a year, and she doesn't know what the unemployment rate is. So please, please keep talking. By yes. the way, I mean there's so many funny people on Twitter. She has been nicknamed She Guevara, which I'm stealing. <laughs> well, okay, so this. Last week, I, I thought of you, about you quite a bit after this Russia stuff. Yep. Doing what you do, I mean, you're you're one of the last few true investigative reporters in existence, and and by that I mean when you come out with a story, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of hours spent dedicated to finding the truth. And I watched Peter Strzok testify, as I'm sure you did, uh, and I saw first thing I saw was a gentleman who sat down, knowing full well in his mind, no one's going to be able to touch me in here. It doesn't matter. And and his smugness and arrogance and all the things that he brought to the table, I think it backfired on him a little bit. But I'm watching uh, a swamp, and he's a he's a he's deep deeply rooted in that swamp, uh, pretty much acting with uh, with with it, with with no worry uh, that they're that that they're not going to be exposed or or be be uh, held accountable. And I'm wondering. How does President Trump navigate this when there's clearly people still working around him that are working against him? Yeah, it, I mean, he's in such a quandary here, and I think that's what accounts for what happened in Helsinki. And and it, it is so difficult to be able to trust these institutions when you have um, – unhinged nutballs like John Brennan and James Comey and Michael Hayden and all of the the paid former uh, intelligence spooks turned um, left-wing resistance leaders um, out there pledging to do everything they can to bring this president down. Um, I think that history is important, and um, Mark Levin's Jibe is absolutely right, and what, what what so many in the media and in politics are counting on are are that uh, the American people have uh, no long term memory uh, about the left and Russia, and also that they have no long term memory about where the media was just you know a decade ago in subverting uh, intelligence agencies and. Uh, publishing leak after leak after leak to damage the Bush administration, even when they were warned by these same intelligence agencies that they were risking the lives of the people who work there. They don't care. Um, and, and the fact is that some of the very programs under the Bush administration that were used um, to collect intelligence on jihadists were then hijacked by the Obama administration to <laughs> perpetrate the the conspiracy that we have seen over the last year um, and the the unmasking of American citizens um, using programs that were meant to, to target jihadists for political p- partisan ends it is galling and day after day after day the Trump administration has to face this onslaught and in so many ways, the, the only outlet that uh, is able to get the truth that, uh, out about all of this is Trump's Twitter account. Right. And that's not uh, – you're not embellishing. That's the sad part it is these same people you just talked about that have turned uh, and weaponized our intelligence agencies are the same people that were exposing our uh, uh, in, in the field people who were the same people I saw the other day going nuts about – Republicans asking questions in a committee meeting about not asking for names, just asking for his, whether uh, Peter Strzok met or talked with. Now suddenly all these sources are, are close to the vest and, oh, my God, we've got to protect them. It's, it's, they get to play both sides of the fence only because the, the, the media is, is overtaking. Um, well, the media no longer has any integrity is, is probably the first and most important thing, the media outside of who and what we are. Um, right. But and you know, one of the, the programs that I did for uh, Michelle Malkin Investigates was on the history of Walter Durante and the New York Times. I mean, it is the New York Times that has led the resistance charge now, drumming up this hysteria over Russia that, that uh, still boasts on um, its historical pages about the Pulitzer Prize awarded to Stalin's mouthpiece, their own columnist, Walter Durante. The lies never end. Well, and by the way, uh, the New York Times is also the employer of a woman who apparently broke into the home 
of a uh, of a campaign official. Uh, yes, I saw that out. on Big League Politics. I mean, these I mean, are the same people who uh, who undermine conservatives' ability to do investigative journalism by accusing us of "quote unquote" stalking when right. we use you know basic mainstream investigative techniques. And these are the people breaking into other people's houses. <laughs> I, I find it very almost elementary in, in its simplicity, in the sense that they're doing and screaming about the same thing. They're yelling about uh, fascism while Antifa is made up of fascists. They're yelling about treason when John Brennan was a card-carrying member of the Communist Party, for crying out loud. Uh, the, the, you know, they're yelling about uh, uh, Russia collusion when Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama did more to ruin potential relations with Russia by being just stupid. I mean, I, who, who doesn't remember the reset button and that, right. that stupid? dumbass thing but here's here's where it gets to 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 where i rely on people like you i have not heard anything since it happened about the awan brothers which i believe is one of the largest scandals in the history of american politics and i wonder if there is it is there no way to find out what happened with all of that given the fact that these people these are two uh 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 Middle Eastern men who had access to every single member of our government's computers. How is that not a story? It, it should be on the front pages. And, uh, of course, Luke Rosiak at The Daily Caller um, deserves a lot of credit for breaking so many of those stories and uh, at least keeping it uh, alive in, in the conservative press. And I, I did a little bit of digging as well, and it, what troubled me was – uh, that so many of the Democrats who had hired the Awan brothers refused to ask my answer my simple question, and that was, how did those men get here? Um, this goes to a fundamental question about who we let into the country and why. Um, and there was a lot of um, speculation that they came here under the H-1B program, and that is the subject of a lot of national security and economic security concerns, um, being uh, uh, basically, um, you know, allowing uh, all of these cheap foreign IT workers to come in here and, and displace American workers. And the national security implications of that have been raised by the opponents of the program since it was instituted in, in 1990. Well, I had uh, contacted about five different House Democrats who had employed the Awan brothers and their family, and they still refused to, to answer that question. Uh, Chuck Grassley actually um, had uh, sent a letter asking the same question and didn't get an answer. If we can't get these basic questions answered about who we let into this country, who sponsored them, you know, what connection they had here, um, I mean, I think that's the key to unraveling the entire scandal. And I, I, let me just also ask this question, and, and I'm dying to hear from someone uh, as into it as you are. Every time that I mention something about Clinton and Uranium One or the, uh, the Clinton Foundation or Obama and their, you know, we know now that they conspired with Fusion GPS and our, our Department of Justice and FBI to rig a presidential election. But every time I mention them, uh, liberals say move on. And my response is always the same. Those two people are why we are where we are. The things that they did, the crimes that they committed, the administration bungling everything and anything it touched, those are the reasons why, and I don't know if Trump's going to be able to dig out of it in our lifetime, the cesspool that we're in right now uh, from a foreign relations perspective that Trump is getting us out of was created by these two people. And, and that just seems to be kind of an afterthought. Well, let's move on. Well, you can't move on because there's, their damage is still here. Yeah, that's right. And, of course, it goes stretches back to the mid-1990s during um, Bill Clinton's reign um, when he was doing the China Gate business. And, you know, you want to talk about foreign meddling in oh. election cycles. I mean, the press had buried its head in the sand. And what did they do? They called people like me who were digging into all of those donations racist, even though I'm so-called Asian-American myself. So they've <laughs> perfected these tactics for 25, 30 years at the expense of our sovereignty and our national security. Well, they also think that, and, and I, this is the only part I find offensive. They think we're as stupid as they sound. The things <laughs> that they say and they do, they that they have a, a large contingent of sheep who follow them along, you know, and follow them around and take every word as as if it's gospel. But but 
the fact that we know better was shown in the 2016 election. And now I believe Newt Gingrich. I believe we're going to pick up four to six seats in the midterms. Um, and, and, you know, God bless that happening. But also I can't even fathom where they go with that one because they, uh, it, it, they're expecting a blue wave. They're not going to get it. And uh, they continue to walk away from all of the, I mean, I just listened to Keith Ellison call our national borders an injustice for those trying to cross them. I mean, I, I, you know, thank you for being the DNC deputy chair, sir, and please keep speaking. Um, oh, yeah. But, I mean, we should circulate that picture of him uh, walking at a march with the, the shirt that says, Yo no creo en fronteras. I mean, there, there, right. I mean, there's no mistaking. He doesn't believe in borders. And then, uh, you know, so many of these pretending moderates in the Democrat Party get so offended uh, when you basically read the writing on the wall or Keith Ellison's T-shirt. Um, I think you had it right, which is keep Ocasio-Cortez and her ilk talking, and yes, we'll be riding a red wave through the midterms. Let me let me ask you a very simple question that has, it's got to be some sort of deep, complicated answer that I'm just missing. At what point does the logic become uh, uh, relevant or, 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 or w- at what point do they enter the logical thought process of, of we need to eliminate ICE to be safer? We need to eliminate a law enforcement agency that protects our borders to be safer. It, 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 I mean – there is no – I can't think of a connect-the-dots pattern in logic thinking that gets you to that conclusion. But we saw them – you know, and it's it's classic liberal. They all called for abolishing ICE, then they put it to a vote, and none of them voted for it. But the fact <laughs> of the matter is over 70 percent of Americans are, are – which blows me away because there's actually 30 percent of people in this country who believe ICE should be abolished. But yeah. over 70 percent of Americans think that that's an idiotic thing to do. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, the far left um, reveals its two colors, and the fact is that they've mainstreamed that very idea, even though um, at the polls uh, normal, rational people reject it. It is a mainstream idea of the Democrat Party, and they have, may have run away from that vote, but but uh, look what happened after Ocasio-Cortez upset Joe Crowley. All of those elected Senate Democrats rushed to embrace that general idea. Not only were they talking about defunding or abolishing ICE, um, they were, <laughs> I mean, they, they basically have said that they want to disarm our ICE agents um, and prevent them from doing the core mission of interior enforcement in this country. People forget that the reason why all of those immigration and enforcement agencies were reorganized under DHS is that we realized after 9-11 that interior enforcement led to a majority of those hijackers being able to stay here after they yes. had illegally overstayed their visas. Yep. It's not and, just and about I, building a wall. And it never has been, which, by right. the way, is a great segue. I want to ask you, I just saw yesterday the first 200 miles uh, of the wall have been funded. Uh, and my assumption is they're going to start rather soon. Um, when that wall starts to go up, where does the argument? Ch- how does the argument change for the left? I mean, here's the thing: they're arguing about things they can't change, and 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 they're you know just like the Kavanaugh, uh, Justice Kavanaugh is going to get confirmed. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, uh, on, on no planet is that going to not happen unless somebody does something illegal, which I wouldn't put past them. But the fact of the matter is, this wall is going to be funded and start to go up, and then the left, it, you know. Because here, the thing you and I have been able to stand on for 18 months is, listen, why are you acting surprised? He said he was going to do it as a candidate. He promised he was going to do it as a candidate. And unlike Obama, the promises he made, he's keeping to the letter. And, and they say, well, what about the wall? Well, the fact the wall isn't up is because of the swamp. That, that's the only reason it's not already being built. But, but when the wall starts to go up, where do they go next? What, 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 because it's going to be someplace irrational. It's going to be someplace that you can't logically explain. Um, and Kavanaugh's going to be in, which means our Second Amendment will be safe for at least a couple decades. Uh, I still believe Ruth Bader Ginsburg is going to, uh, at some point, not be a justice anymore, and we're going to be looking at a 6-3 majority, which is, I can't imagine where their heads are going to explode on that one. But the wall gets built, the wall starts getting built. Where does he turn his attention, President Trump, to? Well, I, yeah, I, I think that the that, uh, border enforcement and immigration enforcement is a never-ending job. And um, I think that he's going to have to continue on th- uh, to make good on the, the rest of his promises in, in that platform. And you'll remember that it's not just about 
um, border security. I talked right. about um, the visa reform that needs to be done. And, and you know but, what? But I apologize. Also- let me let me let me just interrupt you real quick. Yeah, I I, I wanted you. I should have asked you this question. He's going to start getting his wall. What does and I asked Sheriff Clark this yesterday. What does a, a border security look like if Trump gets his way and, and all is said and done? What does it look like to you physically and psychologically? Yeah, well, it looks like what they've promised, um, which is, I mean, we have to finish the rest of the Secure Fence Act from 2006, which I always called FINO, a fence in name only. I mean, it is a combination <laughs> of, you know, the concrete barrier that people think of when they think of a wall, but also, it also means um, electronic surveillance that actually works. It, it means... Right satellites, it, it means helicopters, it means deploying all of our assets at the border. Um, and I hate the phrase, until the border is secure. The border will never be secure. Nope. It is an ongoing mission. Um, but then there's also the, the other parts of um, the RAISE Act, um, which takes a look at revamping our entire legal immigration structure. It is systemic. I mean, that was the message yes. of the two books that I've written on this, um, on immigration policy. Invasion, on the one hand, which is about uh, our physical borders and our ports uh, and our, our visa um, enforcement mechanisms, but it's also about economic security and protecting American workers and putting them first again, and that was the subject of Sold Out. Well, and you've covered this extensively, and and – you know, I, I think we can both agree. You'll never secure the border completely, but you will stop the, the Titanic wave and, and force it into being a trickle, which is not a bad thing. I mean, the cartels, uh, our, our ICE agents and our Border Patrol uh, are, are outgunned and outmanned at the border because they're, they're fighting cartels with limitless budgets. Uh, and they're, they're literally being asked to fight the fight with one hand tied behind their back by Democrats, which is a crime in and of itself. Um, you now you can go all the way back to Fast and Furious to watch how bad the the, the left has handled our border security, but the uh, when you slow that to a trickle, I, here's the thing: much like the, the the travel ban, I look at this as you know what we just need to be able to step back for a second and take a breath, reassess where everything is, and then move forward. This is and that's hard to do in this 25 hour a day news cycle that is hyperactive at every turn because the world is ending every time President Trump opens his mouth. Yeah, that's right. And, well, that's why yeah. I've loved doing uh, Michelle Malkin investigates on CRTV. We have a two part series that we did when I traveled uh, to the border last summer and spent time not only with agents there but also with ranchers who've had to deal with this for years and years and years. I mean, it's essentially it's been an undeclared war. Uh, on Americans, and and it's those ranchers and property owners and families that have gotten short shrift. I also did um, an episode, um, which people can watch on CRTV, about the ambush on Highway 57 and the injustice um, that was perpetrated against two of our special agents who were ICE agents, Jaime Zapata, who was killed, and Victor Avila, who was shot and injured, who's still trying to get answers that uh, from uh, intelli- intelligence and, and information that was hidden and buried by the Obama ad- administration about that ambush south, south of the border. There's so much, I think that you're absolutely right, there's so much that still needs to be cleaned up and unwound and exposed from the past three or four um, administrations, that um, it, it is hard to keep up and make sense of everything. And, and, um, and, and, it, and if you merely are stuck, you know, to like the IV of social media, you tend to, to lose the forest for the trees. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and, and, you know, it, it, it's just the, the shiny object is, is, has never been more prevalent in media. You know, the, the left can make anybody pay attention to things that they don't really want uh, uh, to pay attention to, but it, in, it's in lieu of seeing the truth and uncovering the truth. Uh, Michelle Malkin investigates on CRTV. I can't even begin to tell you guys some of the stuff you, you'll you get a chance to see. Michelle's been uncovering stories uh, left and right for years now, and there's stuff that you, I guarantee you, you're going to see stuff and think, wait, why have I never heard about this? Um, Michelle, always a pleasure. Great catching up with you. Look forward to catching up down the road. 
Thank you, and congratulations on your show. Welcome to the Thank fam. Thank you. Breitbart News Tonight with Joel Pollack and Rebecca Menasor. The real thing that the left is angry about is they're like, how could you allow these Russian memes? Somebody saw a meme, and then they decided they had to vote for Trump. Or it must have been fake news. And by fake news, they mean conservative websites. Come on. But this is what the left thinks. Fake news. And by fake news, what they mean is shut down Breitbart. Breitbart News Tonight. Weeknights, starting at 9 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125. We want to hear from you. Tweet the show at Garrick 38. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Joining me now is someone who I had weekly uh, on whatever it takes, and I haven't been able to talk to him for a couple weeks, and I certainly have missed uh, the voice of reason he usually brings to the table. If you haven't read him, go to Breitbart.com right after this show ends and and do search for Jerome Hudson. Some of my favorite stuff coming off the website has been stuff that he has authored. Good morning, Jerome. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great. It is good to hear your voice. It's great to be back. Well, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you. In the day and age of, of so little rhyme and reason to what we're seeing on television it's always nice to have someone who's got a perspective that's grounded in reality and is exposing things there's so many things i wanted to to, to catch up with you about but i i I saw a picture uh, the other day there was a a young man who was gunned down uh, uh, by police officers uh in a confrontation felt very much to me like the trayvon martin thing once I saw pictures of this young man who apparently had pictures all over social media of him with guns and, you know, an Uzi in one and pistols in the other one. And the left was trying as hard as it could to paint this kid out to be Mr. Rogers' son. And and I, I'm not saying one way or the other wasn't, but this was clearly not a kid walking an old lady across the street. This was someone committing a crime. What happens when you face the police uh, and you're armed, you get shot. And the war on police and our law enforcement feels like it's harder now uh, than it's ever been. And and I'm yeah. wondering what you what your thoughts are as we listen to Democrats talk about eliminating really ICE. Not, you know, to put a button on it, crime is obviously usually not my beat. I mean, I'm the, I'm the editor of Hollywood. But that said, I monitor, you know, over 100 Twitter accounts from various entertainment figures every day. And most of them are leftists. And I did notice um, that video uh, and a story, local Chicago news story, about uh, a man, uh, 37-year-old Harith Augustus, um, the, the, the Chicago PD released the, 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 the body cam footage. And it, it, it basically shows this, this 37-year-old black man you know, walking down the street, and he's just being approached by a couple different officers. And, you know, he, it, 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 his guns are brandished in plain sight. Um, right. And, you know, he his response is the type, is everything that you do if you want to be shot and killed by police. Um, right. Like I said, it's not my beat, but I, I just noticed it. No, but I, yeah, I, I always, this is a conversation um, I always want to have with you because you, you're, yeah, you know, I, uh, it, it's just fascinating and, and terrifying at the same time. It is such a horrific tragedy, and it is also a cautionary tale. Look, and, 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 and what I think Wendell Pierce, who is, you know, a prolific actor in his own right, um, I love him. You know, and Ray Donovan, he has one of the worst sex scenes in Waiting to Exhale. Uh, but Wendell Pierce was basically uh, making the point um, that the police just sought this man out and gunned him down. And again, um, you know, his name was Harith Augustus. Um, you, you just go, A.W.R. Hawkins covered it. But, you know, the police can approach anyone at any point in time. Um, and what you do not do is everything that this this young man did right. uh, when the police approached him? Um, it, but it but it but it goes, I guess you know, to your larger point is that you know, people on the left um, who who end up on on the left side of the political spectrum just have a warped idea and understanding of law enforcement in this country because they because they they have a warped idea of of the rule of law. I think that's basically what it is. Any person who, who signs up, who under, undergoes the training, puts in the hours and the time and the energy, 
and then puts on, you know, the uniform of a Border Patrol agent, they don't they don't wake up every day looking to 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 act out the the craziest and heinous crimes. It's it's the same for any officer in this country. By by and large, sure there's some bad apples, but most border patrol agents, uh, many of them, as, as as you know, and it's and it's really intuitive. Many of them are Latino. Like right. I mean, they can speak the language of the people who they're most likely going to be encountering with people who speak Spanish, um, and they're just great people. And the way that they've been vilified, the way that they've been compared to SS and Nazi soldiers is absolutely uh, uh, insane. But again, I mean, it's so normal for, and I mean, we're talking about sitting politicians. And right. I think we actually talked about this. We haven't talked in a month, but we were, we, I think I brought up the point that, that sitting United States Congress people were actually planning to bring a vote on the floor of the House of Representatives to abolish a law enforcement agency in ICE that is literally on the front lines. I mean, these people are 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 on the front lines in separating us from what is a failed narco state in Mexico. I mean, it's insane. Right. Hey, I'm going to switch over to uh, your sweet spot here. I want to talk about Hollywood, and and I got to tell you, other than playing John Gerard, I don't think this man's ever done anything in his life uh, worthy of attention. But Sasha Cohen's, who is America? Um, is I, I, I'm I, I'm not going to be able to watch it. He, he repulses me, number one, but some of the stuff that yeah. he wrote about being done in the movie, that it failed epically in its debut, which is a great thing. Uh, I love it. I love the fact that it, <laughs> right. because it, I mean, it's, it's I, to call it infantile would be probably as high a compliment as you could give it. But I want yeah. you to talk about, uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming you've seen it. Yep. Let me preface it by saying this. This is a guy who emulated a wounded warrior in getting uh, a time with Sarah Palin. And when I called him out on Twitter as, as, you know, a stolen valor, I was told you can't be someone, you can't steal valor if you're not an American citizen, which I call complete bullshit on. But this guy is repulsive. He's not funny. Uh, again, except for right. Caldega Nights. And the stuff that he was doing is so incredibly uncomfortable and stupid. Why does it have a place? What's funny about it? Well, it does have a place, but... Uh, a- you know, Noti wrote up the ratings that came out yesterday. And yeah. so I don't actually think that it has a very large place in in the larger conversation in politics and its intersection uh, with popular culture. Like, he, the, the interviews, I mean, if anybody's watching it, look, it's okay. I'm in the trenches for you every day, and so I, I got you. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I watched it. I wrote the review. Um, And I think the large takeaway is that here is a a British comedian who, you know, hasn't done anything of accomplishment for at least a decade. Um, He spent the majority of the Trump presidency traveling the country, heavily disguised, and and on occasion, um, at least in the view of, of, of Sarah Palin, Um, you know, impersonating uh, a veteran of the United States military who who's disabled Um, in the in the first segment, he sits down with Bernie Sanders. I thought it was a wasted segment. I thought it was really unoriginal and and not really funny. I mean, Sacha Baron Cohen is most popular because of his Ali G pranks. Um, I think one of his uh, most popular uh, sit downs was with Donald Trump. Uh, in the early 2000s, and Donald Trump basically figured out that he was being lampooned and ended the the conversation within minutes. Um, but that's what we're getting now, 15 years later. But it's just with you know people like Bernie Sanders. Right. And again, I think the larger takeaway is that here you have uh, a, a, a guy who who hasn't been relevant in a long time. And he's basically just mocking regular citizens for the most part. I mean, even in the gun parody spoof segment that 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 really got some sitting you know lawmakers in trouble because they kind of went along with it i mean this thing is heavily edited we don't actually see the raw footage we don't see any conversations that go on behind the scenes um and there'll be about six more episodes of 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 just lackluster 30 minutes you know of entertainment i mean it's right it's just adding to the noise in my yeah. opinion. No, it's not 
worthy of five minutes of anybody's <laughs> time. Uh, it, it's he's such a clown. I want to I want to get your quick take on it's it's hard to do it in, in in a short period of time. But two things: one, did you watch the Peter Strzok hearings? And if you did, what did you what was your what was your your take coming out of that? Uh, I had it I had it streaming in the background. Um, so like most things, I was watching it through the prism of the celebrities who were commenting on it. And so, you know, Breitbart, we have, we really do have a world-class news machine. And so, you know, we have reporters who dedicated much of their professional lives to understanding these things. And, and we're reporting with great specificity, all of the context behind everything that he's saying um, you know, he went to a Walmart and he and he thought that the people there at that Walmart who live in that town uh, were stank, dis- uh, disgusting and gross. Right. Um, I mean, we're, this is a despicable human being who happened to be a high ranking official in the Federal Bureau of Inge- Invest- uh, Investigation. Like he is the embodiment of everything that President Trump holds in disdain when he speaks of the deep state and when Breitbart News reports about this intelligence apparatus that is in lockstep against the sitting president of the United States, Peter Strzok, he represents all of that. And I'm, and I'm, you know, to your, to your question, I am, I am looking at people like James Gunn, who, you know, is, in his own right, a, a great director and a great writer, but he's calling the man an, an American patriot. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's just, it's we surreal. live in two different worlds. It's um, surreal. We, we but, really hey, do. One of the, the stories that has been kind of under the radar has been the uh, fact that there, I think, some somewhat somewhere north of 40,000 uh, sealed federal indictments, which to put in perspective, and I think in 2000, and 11, there were 6,000. Uh, and a lot of discussion around pedophilia, sex ring, the, the child's trafficking, sex rings, and all this other stuff. Every day that goes by, someone else in Hollywood is put on the front burner uh, as a potential pedophile, a sexual criminal. A Hollywood writer and director, is it Luke Besson, is now on the front burner. And it's amazing to me how it is always the people with the most power yeah. in Hollywood. But this is not a little thing, and it, it continues yeah. to grow. And I'm wondering, at some point, does the lid blow off of this? Um, I mean, look, this guy, you know, some of these people, I mean, they are there. If you go to their IMDb page, I mean, you just, it, they're just so prolific. And to your point, so powerful and so influential. Um, you know, I just, it's. It's it's a it's a town, Los Angeles. Um, you know the county, all of it, and, and in many respects, New York City, as is Washington D.C. I mean, these are these are epicenters of power. Um, they are filled with very affluent and very influential people, um, and they are very dark. The people yeah. and and the places themselves. Um, and so when people ask. How does this happen? Um, that is that is what your operating assumption should be. I mean, there are there are very blue collar, lovable, law abiding, and even Trump supporting Americans who live and work um, in and around L.A. Um, but but again, this is this is an example of a very powerful individual um, who is who is deeply rooted in an entertainment culture that every day wakes up and goes to sleep judging the rest of America and, and, and accusing its, its, its citizens of being the homophobic, being the sexual deviant, racist uh, uh, people that we are not, when they are themselves absolutely guilty of all of those sins. Hey, big man, it's always a pleasure. We got to do this a little bit more often. I can't, uh, uh, I'm yeah. not fond of, uh, but now that I've changed formats, I can, I can, uh, I can grab you and set it up ahead of time. Uh, but it's always good to hear your voice, man. Yes, sir.
God bless you. All right, Jerome Hudson from Breitbart. Thanks again to Michelle Malkin. Uh, always a pleasure to catch up with, with Jerome Hudson. Winners and losers, kind of simple today. I'm going to go uh, my loser. There was a lot of candidates, as always, uh, but I'm going to go with uh, Sasha Cohen uh, was a very easy loser for today, and, and uh, he was probably somebody that could probably win the award multiple times weekly. But he is my loser. Adam Schiff was also somebody I was considering, and I, I was going to give it to uh, Ocasio-Cortez, although I don't want to shine any negative light. I want her to keep talking. My winner today is probably doesn't realize that she won, but she, based on the fact that Lisa Page's testimony rebuts Peter Strzok's, and she did discuss opening the case based on whether McCabe was running the FBI, uh, which is not a small thing. That that She gets my win, even though I don't think she was trying to do it. But we're going to find out uh, exactly what we thought we knew when he was opening his mouth, which is that this was a... Fully biased and rigged from the beginning investigation in that they were all conspiring to rig a democratically held presidential election. And that is, that's going to come out at some point, someday it's going to come out. Hey, tomorrow, uh, Representative Warren Davidson is going to join me. Uh, you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, thanks again to Michelle Malkin. Thanks again to Jerome Hudson. God bless. We'll catch you guys tomorrow. Have a great day. take a couple of the references to Donald Trump from hip-hop. And then we're going to try to see if we can figure out why they like Donald Trump. Jay-Z said, I'm at the Trump International. Ask for me. Raekwon said, I'm the black Trump. They are comparing themselves to what he represents. His wealth, his achievement. Capitalism. Sonny's Corner with Sonny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125.